Kate Chopin's The Story of an Hour is the shortest story that we have read so far and will probably take a lot less than an hour to read. It's only a few pages. I like to include it for reasons that are similar to um, our reading of At Home in the sense that this is a story that even though it was composed uh, quite a while ago, uh, the end of the, uh, uh, the 19th century in uh, 1894, it seems to still speak uh, to concerns or possibilities that are relevant to people today, okay? So let's just, again, kind of step back and bring some of our fundamental concepts to the story so that we can begin to proceed through the story. We begin from the presumption, or the assumption, excuse me, that the story has something to say, okay? This is a story that is coming to us not randomly, but it's coming to us um, because of the fact that for well over a century, numerous people before us have come to this story and they have found something relevant here. They have found something interesting here. So it's not something like, you know, a random commercial on television and you have to wonder, is this commercial going to be entertaining or not? You can begin with the assumption that a great many people before you have come to this story and have found something noteworthy. And so the question to always begin with is what's going to be interesting here? Or why might it be that so many people have found this to be interesting? And we can start pursuing that in an organized way. If we ask ourselves again, you know, the basic question, what could this, what, are, what is it going to tell me about certain people, places, or things, or certain people, places, and events? What is this story going to describe um, that will be uh, interesting or useful uh, or um, will somehow enable me to gain a view of the world that's beyond my everyday view. Okay, so we begin with that premise. As we get into the story, we might immediately notice that the story is being told to us from a third person perspective. So on page 99, um, knowing that Mrs. Mallard was afflicted with a heart trouble, great care was taken to break to her as gently as possible the news of her husband's death. Okay, so there's no quotations around the speech. Uh, we know it's coming from a third person perspective, and so we might initially um, or immediately begin to wonder a little bit about the characteristics of this voice. What are the qualities of this voice? At this stage, we might pay attention to um, the word choice, how formal the voice may seem. We might, as we'll see in a little bit, start to wonder a lot about why it's describing uh, the world in the way it's describing the world, but that'll make more sense in a few paragraphs. So as we get into the story, one of the things we understand is that very quickly the story is essentially setting up a scenario. Okay, so it's letting us know that something very dramatic has happened um, that is going to shape the rest of the story. Now this isn't necessarily how every uh, story we've read this term has proceeded, right? If we think about Everyday Use by Alice Walker, we know fairly early on in that tale that uh, Dee is coming to visit Mama and Maggie and that the mother's excited about that. And that gives us some sense of where the story is going to go. When we read Uncle Ben's Choice, it's not at all clear in the first few paragraphs, even maybe the first few pages, what that story is going to be about. You might remember all the time that Uncle Ben, uh, that character takes describing to us his social situation, his financial situation, his ba basic ethics for life. It's not about a real dramatic event. The dramatic event shows up quite unexpectedly. When we think about a story like What You Pawn, I Will Redeem, we do have a pretty good sense early on what that story is going to be about because we know within the first couple of pages that there's this regalia that Jackson Jackson wants to pursue and then the rest of the story has to do with his pursuit of that regalia. If we think about Cathedral, um, we know very early on that the blind man, Robert, is coming to spend some time with our narrator and that that's a primary concern. If we think about uh, the swimmer, okay, that's a little bit different. We know the journey that our narrator's on, but we don't quite know why he's on that journey. Uh, and then finally, if we think about at home, very early on in that story, the basic problem is established, and we know right away that the father is going to have to deal with his son, his very young son who is smoking and he has to convince him otherwise. So when we think about the stories that we've read, one of the things we might be noticing as a general pattern is that very early on in these stories, 
something significant is established, not in all the stories, but in most of them, and then the story goes on to kind of explore that significant thing and its consequences. So for example, story of an hour, we are told right away that Mr. Mallard has died in a train crash, okay, and that his wife is being delivered the news, but that it has to be delivered in a very careful way because she apparently has some kind of heart ailment and they don't want to overexcite her. I mean that in a sense that they don't want to make her so anxious uh, with the news that she dies. So that's the basic concern. But one of the things that we see very early in the story is that the expectation that the news of the husband's death is going to be, you know, um, uh, horrifying or destroying for Mrs. Mallard, okay, for Louise, is that it's not that at all. In fact, hearing that her husband has died leads her to this moment of wonderful kind of freedom and revelation because she recognizes that she's no longer going to have to be under her husband's command. She's no longer going to have to sacrifice her will to what it is her husband wants in life because now he's dead and she can have the freedom that she couldn't have when he was alive. Well, let's back up again and think about some of the basic things we've thought about in terms of stories so far this semester. One of the things that we've said is that in most of the stories that we're going to read, one of the basic things that happens is that we see somebody transform, right? We see somebody undergo some kind of significant change. And while the story of an hour is literally only uh, three pages long, we see a big change for Mrs. Mallard, right? Not only does she learn that her husband is dead, but she goes from the grief of hearing the news to a, a state of kind of ecstatic excitement because she recognizes the freedom that the death offers her. And then, of course, we get the end of the story, which I'll talk about more in a couple of minutes. But notice just the consistency with which these stories are doing kind of the same thing. The stories are showing an individual going through a meaningful transformation, and the stories are, generally speaking, establishing the basic problem or the basic situation that's going to lead to the change generally within the first couple of pages. And once you start to recognize that a lot of stories are, work, are, are, are operating this way, you gain the ability to read a, a short story and not necessarily be con so confused. So you understand that within the first couple of pages, the essential problem, the essential premise for the tale is going to be established. And that problem, that premise, is more likely than not going to relate to how and why it is the main character in the story transforms. Okay, and once you understand those basic moves, then you can start to ask yourself about, you know, what are some of the qualities of the problem? What are some of the qualities of the transformation? How is this person a different person by the end of the story? And why might that be significant? Why might that be important? Well, okay, so let's look at the end of this story, which is uh, one that I love to discuss with students in class. Um, but by the end of the story, we know that Mrs. Mallard has gone through this moment of incredible liberation uh, because her husband is dead, not out of anger. She doesn't, she doesn't dislike her husband, uh, but she enjoys the possibility of her own freedom more, right? So she's gone through this ecstatic transformation. Uh, we're very happy for her. Now let's look on 101, uh, the last, oh, several paragraphs on that page. Um, I'll read a little bit here. Her fancy was running riot along those days ahead of her, spring days and summer days and all sorts of days that would be her own. She breathed a quick prayer that life might be long. It was only yesterday she had thought with a shudder that life might be long. That's her transformation, right? She arose at length and opened the door to her sister's uh, importunities. There was a fervent triumph in her eyes, and she carried herself unwittingly like a goddess of victory. She clasped her sister's waist, and together they descended the stairs. Richards stood waiting for them at the bottom. Someone was opening the front door with a latch key. It was Brentley Mallard who entered, a little travel stain, composedly carrying his grip sack and umbrella. He had been far from the scene of accident and did not even know that there had been one. He stood amazed at Josephine's piercing cry and Richard's quick motion to scream him from the view of his wife. But Richard's was too late. 
And when the doctors came, they said she had died of heart disease, of joy that kills. Okay. Um, what, what has happened at the end of this story? There are a couple of ways to read the story, okay? And they all raise questions. Um, if we think about the fact that she dies, well, we might wonder a little bit about, about who it is that dies. That question um, comes up as well. But let's just say for a second that it's, it's, it's Brentley Mallard's wife who dies, right? Well, then why does she die? Well, one way to read this is that she dies because she's so upset that her husband is still alive. Um, if he had simply been dead, uh, tragic as that would have been, um, she could have gone on to live a life full of freedom, a life full of happiness. Uh, she, clearly, we know that she was not happy before she received the possible news that um, her husband had died in the train accident. So she has all this freedom in front of her, and then uh, Brentley Mallard shows up again, and uh, crushes that hope. We know she has a heart condition, and so and so she dies, right? Um, although that would seem to be the exact opposite interpretation that the doctors would have. The doctors, at the very last sentence, right, when the doctors came, they said she had died of heart disease, of joy that kills. So that interpretation is that she's so happy to see her husband that um, it just kills her. She, she just, she was so stressed and she was so nervous. And then when she saw her husband walk through the door, her body simply couldn't handle the joy and she died. Now we as the reader, because we've been provided, you know, her thoughts and her reflections and her observations by the narrator, we know that that is not the case more than likely. It is more than likely the case that she died because she had so much freedom in front of her and then it was snatched away at the last possible minute. Okay. How do we get there? How do we get to that understanding? And the way we get to that understanding is by paying very careful attention to our narrator, our third person narrator, and how it is the narrator describes the world that our character, all right, um, uh, our character Louise is in. So if you look at the bottom of 99, what you're going to see, and this runs really until, let's say, the middle of 100, is we're going to be getting all of these descriptions of the world that come to us from the third-person narrator. But if we pay attention to the, the world that's being described, the kinds of words that are used, the kind of atmosphere that's being constructed, the tone that the voice is giving us, one of the things that we understand is that this is perhaps a world of possibility, hope, and joy, which sounds strange because we just have this train accident that's been described, right? So if we go to um, uh, right into the middle of uh, 99, she did not hear the story as many women have heard the same. That's our first tip. Uh, with a paralyzed inability to accept its significance, she wept at once with sudden wild abandonment in her sister's arms. Wild abandonment's an odd phrase, right? That's not usually a phrase you would use to describe somebody having a breakdown. Uh, wild abandonment is a kind of a joyful expression. So it's one of our first tips that something is happening here that might not exactly meet our expectations. When the storm of grief had spent itself, she went away to her room alone. She would have no one follow her. Okay, well, that's not so odd given the context of the story. That there stood facing the open window a comfortable, roomy armchair. Into this she sank, pressed down by a physical exhaustion that haunted her body and seemed to reach her soul. Okay, she's exhausted. Again, that's not all that strange given what she was just told. She could see in the open square before her house the tops of trees that were all a quiver with new spring life. Okay. Um, so why? I mean, so we're focusing here on new spring life, on kind of a freshness, which would seem to be very different than what we would expect from somebody who had just heard that her husband had been killed, right? She's focusing on the treetops. The delicious breath of rain was in the air. Again, would you be noticing, um, uh, the fragrance or the scent of rain, um, if you had just received that news uh, and you were devastated by it? 
In the street below, a peddler was crying his wares. The notes of a distant song, which someone was singing, reached her faintless, faintly, and countless sparrows were twittering in the eaves. So she's, she's listening to all the sounds outside. She's kind of stunned, but she's absorbing the world around her. But the world that she's absorbing is not one that seems to be negative at all. In fact, it seems to be quite exciting, rather nice. There were patches of blue sky showing here and there through the clouds that had met and piled one above the other in the west facing her windows. She sat with her head thrown back upon the cushion of the chair, quite motionless, except when a sob came up from her throat and shook her, as a child who has cried itself to sleep continues to sob in its dreams. Well, that's interesting because if you're crying in your dreams, right, it's very unintentional. It's very much a reflex. Um, she's not doing this consciously. She's just kind of there stunned, kind of crying almost absentmindedly, um, which is, again, another tip-off that something, something strange has happened. Uh, and then we get a sense of what that is as we get um, a little bit further into this. She was young with a fair, calm face whose lines bespoke repression and even a certain strength, but now there was a dull stare in her eyes whose gaze was fixed far away off yonder on one of those patches of blue sky. It was not a glance of reflection, but rather indicated a suspension of intelligent thought. So she's had this news and she's essentially shut down. She's soaking in the positive details of the nice day outside. And then she comes to this revelation, skipping down a few lines. When she abandoned herself, uh, a little whispered word escaped her slightly parted lips. She said it over and over under her breath, free, free, free. And from there on, we get this very interesting description of her reasoning, how she is very happy now, potentially, because while she's sad, she doesn't have any hatred for the husband who's dead. She recognizes that the death is going to give her possibilities in terms of controlling her own life while she's still young, uh, that she did not have when the husband was present in her life. So we have this transformative experience that comes about in this moment of intense grief and we get to see it happen. Well, why is it that people like this story so much? Why is it that this story has been so popular? If we just take aside for the moment the ending um, and we think about you know the fact that a lot of people um, historically, we know this in the U.S. certainly because of very high divorce rates, um, might not be happy in the marriages that they're in. Socially, the, the expectation is that when a spouse dies, it's very tragic and it's very devastating, and surely it is um, and for many, many, many people. But one of the things the story is doing is it's giving us insight into what life might be like for someone who's living under different conditions. So if there's somebody who's in a marriage that's not a good marriage, or if they're in a marriage that is you know, negative or constraining to them in some way, and they see no end to that, they see no way that can ever change, here we have a, a character, a young woman being dramatized who suddenly sees that possibility, right, and sees what might be possible for her on the other side. Now, this speaks to a range of social concerns um, that might absolutely be crucial to any number of people that, uh, you know, a modern day person might meet in their, in, the, in their daily life, somebody who is not at all happy uh, in, in a marriage or in a relationship and who doesn't see it as a positive source for their life, but also doesn't see any way out of it, right? Um, and so here we have Mrs. Mallard, who has this experience of thinking, I'm finally free of this marriage, which is not positive for me, um, and I can, I can move on, I can do something else with my life. The tragedy, of course, being that she's wrong in the sense that her husband is not dead, comes home and her awareness that that sense of freedom has been snatched from her um, is enough to kill her, okay, is enough to um, make her, uh, turn her aspiration to live under her own command into the anxiety that she will never in fact have that. Um, and that anxiety, okay, results presumably in what seems to be the heart attack that kills her at the end of the story. So it's very dramatic. Uh, it's a very quick story that gives us uh, some interesting insight into a very uh, unfortunate uh, situation, um, but it can raise all kinds of questions uh, for people about what it is that people do or don't do in, in, a, in a relationship if they are 
um, able to live the life they want to live or if they find themselves constrained by the person that they're, they're living with and the choices that people make to navigate that. It's obviously a very negative portrayal because this is a very sad situation, uh, but it, it allows us to ask questions uh, about people and relationships that we might not ask very often. Um, and we might not understand that many people are perhaps living with, particularly if we're in a very good, very happy relationship, which hopefully everybody is, right? But this story points us in the direction of those who aren't. And it shows us how desperate that can be. So it's a rather interesting story. Um, it does all the basic things we've been saying short stories do um, over the past couple of weeks. And hopefully at this point, again, we're starting to see that even though some of these stories have very different narrators and are written by different people in different times, they're kind of doing the same basic thing. They're establishing a situation and then they're showing us somebody transform in relation to that situation. And that transformation is what's so important about many of these situations because the transformation kind of humanizes these characters. It allows us to see what's so interesting about them and how they might be relevant to our own understanding or lack of understanding of the world. So I hope you enjoy the story and I look forward to seeing what you have to say about it.